Today we're gonna brew by the book. Haunting brew mead from the Elder Scrolls cookbook. So this is the second Skyrim mead that we've done from this book. The last one was the Blackbriar and there was a couple of alterations that we made. There's gonna be a couple of things we changed in this one too, but we're trying to stick more to the- uh, The spirit the of the spirit recipe. of the recipe. And Derek is gonna do the reading. I'm gonna do the assembling and you guys get to do the watching and it's all good. So the way they have the recipes written out in this cookbook for their meads is that they start off with what they call a quick mead. And this is the basis for all the meads in this cookbook. Now they also make half gallon batches. We're gonna be doing a full gallon batch. So we're just gonna double everything that they ask for. Another thing that they do is they don't really let it finish. Although they do say that the haunting brew is better when it's been aged or ages better than the Blackbriar because, well, you know, the Haunting Brew were out to make good mead where Blackbriar was just out to make money. We are sticking to a couple of things to make that work. However, we are going to let it finish fermenting because I don't feel it's safe to bottle things that are not finished fermenting. That's why they don't actually recommend bottling theirs. So there's a change. So to start, we're gonna be starting with honey, shockingly enough. And we are gonna be using a honey that was gifted to us by a viewer named Tony. And this is a Nebraskan honey from Draper's. We're actually going to be using the exact amount that they asked for because they asked for two cups of honey, which a cup of honey weighs 12 ounces. So two cups of honey would be 24 ounces times two for a gallon is 48 ounces divided by 16 ounces in a gallon or in a pound, and you get three. So we're going to use three pounds of this honey. And it is a wildflower honey. That was one of the types of honeys that they said should work well in this exact brew. So the next thing they say is six to eight cups spring water. And again, this is for the half gallon. Uh, so eight cups of water is, uh, that's a half gallon. So they're saying to add a full gallon. So I'm gonna add three quarters of a gallon because they're saying six to eight. So that would be three quarters to a gallon. Let's go with somewhere in between because this is a 1.4 gallon fermenter and we already have some volume here. And I know a couple of things that I'll get to in a little while about the volumetrics here. So if you could hand me that pitcher of water that's right over there, just off screen. So three quarters of a gallon is 96 ounces. We have about 112 ounces here, which is somewhere between three quarters and a gallon. So, you know, what? let's just use that. It is also warm water, like blood temperature. Um, I wouldn't say that it's hot though, just to help melt some of that honey, mix it in well. Holding a little bit back because there's something else that has to go in here too. So I don't want to put too for you. Do you want a spoon? I would like a spoon. Now you just want to mix it up. And I want to make sure that I get all that honey mixed in well. That's why you use the warm water. It's totally okay if you get a little sloshy with it. Just try not to make a mess because, you know, your partner might not like it much and you'll have to clean it up later. But a little added oxygen in the beginning is a good thing. It definitely helps the uh, yeast get going and helps with the fermentation. So it helps them thing. be fruitful and to multiply. Yeah. Now we deviated from their recipe already because they said to boil water and that kind of thing. We're not doing any of that. I don't like to heat the honey. They did that to help break down the honey a little bit, but um, I just feel like boiling it, eh, boiling the honey or boiling the water that goes in there. Not, not necessarily the way to go. So we just used warm water to help it break down and it's already mixed through. It took like two minutes, no big deal. See that little bit of foam? That's aeration starting to happen. That's a good thing. All right, I think, I think we're mixed well enough for now. So at this point in the recipe, it tells you to go to your alterations of choice and do your additives. So for the honing brew, we are gonna be adding one tablespoon culinary lavender. Again, that's for a half a gallon, but we've opted to change it up. What did we do? Oh, uh, we decided to go with two tablespoons because we're making um, a full gallon. And there's a thing about lavender that if you use it too much or extracts too much, it can taste a little bit like soap. So to control that, I decided to make a tea with it. That way we can control the amount that's in there. We did two tablespoons in about, you know, a cup and a half of water. It's really more about how much is in the strainer here than how much water there is. Let that go for five minutes. So we're gonna add that directly into the fermenter. Next, they suggest adding a half red apple. Okay. I had a little problem with that because I'm like, half an apple, even in half a gallon? That's one apple for a whole gallon. That's barely anything. So I decided to double that and went with two apples and they didn't say anything about cutting them up. They literally, well, they did because it's a half. Yeah. So you cut half an apple and drop it in there. I thought chopping it up into cubes, 
This is going to increase go. the surface area so that it's easier for the essence of the apple to get into your room. I left the skins on. I did remove the cores and seeds. The seeds can have, um, they have cyanide in them. So you definitely don't want to eat them and they can make things a little bit bitter. Um, the amount of cyanide is really debatable, but still, if you can avoid it, avoid it. If at this point you say, you know, you could have used a brew bag, you are right. And if you want to use a brew bag for this, I probably suggest doing it. We didn't because there's no mention of a brew bag in this recipe and we are trying to stick to the spirit of the recipe. Next ingredient is one inch fresh ginger peeled and sliced thin. And since we're doing a gallon, that means two inches of ginger. I did the best I could to peel and slice it thin. It's peeled and it's chopped up, so here we go. At this point, I want to mix this up because I just want to make sure that everything gets equally moistened in there. Um, the apples are going to float. I'm going to have a fruit cap. I'm going to have to deal with that. They will probably eventually sink. That's really not a problem. The ginger will too, most likely. By the way, I scrubbed those apples really, really good to remove any pesticides or anything that were on them. They are actually an organic apple, so should be fine. But hey, you know what? You never know. So we, we cleaned them up really good before they got put in here. So that is it for our additions. So we go back to the original Quick Meads recipe, and the last thing they say to do is add one packet ale yeast, about one-fourth ounce. Well, before we do that, I have one other change I want to make. This is a mead. Honey isn't known for having all that much nutrients. So 1.5 grams of fermato in a little bit of water, a little added insurance and security. The yeast we're going to be using, which she was just about to get to, is an ale yeast. It's USO4. So it's a really powerful, strong yeast. Never had a problem with it before. And I have most of a packet here. I don't know how I ended up with such a partial packet, but I have most of a packet. It actually calls for a whole packet. The amount of difference, it, it's not gonna matter. That's not gonna alter the, uh, the brew in this particular case. Typically a full packet brews up to five gallons. So I think we're way within the tolerance for this But before we do that, let's take a gravity reading on this. And when I say take a reading, I mean a specific gravity reading. Some people like to use bricks, other people use Play-Doh. We actually are using a digital refractometer today, but you can use a regular refractometer, you can use a hydrometer, whatever you like to use. Ours is gonna read in bricks, but I'll give you the conversion so that you are working in specific gravity just like us. And all I need is just literally a couple of drops right on the tester, 21.5. Four bricks. By the way, this digital refractometer was sent to us by Hannah Instruments. If you'd like to get one of your own or check out what they have, there's a link below. And if you use the keyword city or the promo code, I guess that'd be called, yeah. city, when you're on their site, you get 10% off anything you purchase on that site. Okay, so we got 21.4 bricks. I'm putting that into the Brewer's Friend calculator for bricks to specific gravity. And that's all it does. And I'll hit update and we get 1.0892. I'll go with 1.089. I think that's close enough. So let me take a note on that. What I was talking about earlier with, I know something that I'm gonna to get to. Let me explain. There's a little bit of sugars in those apples. Not that much, maybe five to 10 points. Not, not a tremendous amount. We are already at a 12% potential. The yeast, this one, the Safe Ale SO4, is good to 10%. You, I know what you're saying. So that means it'll go past it, yes. And the way they make their brews, they end up sweet because it's not fully fermented out. Because we're gonna fully ferment it out, I'm making this go past the tolerance of the yeast. Now, I also know USO4 doesn't always listen and yeast can't read like we all know, so it could go to that 12% mark. Anyway, I'm just gonna dump that in there and don't forget to- Crack your packet! Yeah, make sure you get all the little yeasty beasties out of them. And now I wanna mix that through. I actually have high hopes for this. I think this one's actually gonna be really nice. The lavender and apple scent is very, very nice. And ginger and apple always works well together. So I actually have really high hopes that this is gonna be a very good one. The black briar was actually pretty nice. We, we enjoyed it. This one should be better. All right, now we wanna put a lid and airlock on there. I have my notes I have on a piece of paper with a piece of masking tape, you know, gotta be all fancy about it. I'm just gonna stick that on there. That way I can keep track as we go. So what's gonna happen with this now? We're gonna let it sit. But one thing I'm gonna have to do is pay attention to that fruit cap. I wanna make sure I give this a little bit of a shake every couple days. Now by shake, I mean the swirl method. The swirl. You haven't seen this in a while. You pick it up and you give it one of these, just a little bit. 
And yeah, some air is coming out because I pushed on the lid. It's not started quite yet, but it'll probably start up anywhere from a few hours to a few days. If it has, if you're making this at home and it has not started up in three or four days, try raising the temperature a little bit. If you're not already in the mid 70s Fahrenheit, try raising the temperature into that range at least. And if that doesn't work, add fresh yeast. Not from the same batch that you bought that one in because it's probably expired because it's been sitting in your, sitting in your cupboard for like five years. Also, keep your yeast in the refrigerator. Just a good tip all around because it makes it last a lot longer. But anyway, we'll see you once this is ready for the next stage. Okay, so this has been going for about 13 days. Looks like it's slowing down a little bit to me, so it's time to take a first check. Now, don't take that as if this is done, that it's gonna take two weeks to be done. It might take two weeks, it could take one, it could take three, it could take six. That's why we take readings. The time is not the critical factor, the it's readings. the reading. Probably could have done the reading through the little thing, but pouring it back in has proven to be problematic, so. Plus, I like to get a good smell and look at things. It smells nice. And I don't see anything untoward, everything looks good. Um, I have tried to keep the fruit wet every few days, you know, go in there and give it a little bit of a shake. So now we're just going to take a gravity reading. Now, and closer investigation, ignoring what was going on in the airlock, I'm looking at the brew itself. I do see a bunch of little bubbles coming up the side, but oh, yeah. it looks like the majority of them are just trapped underneath an apple piece. So that could simply be degassing and not further fermentation. That's why, again, we rely Take on the, the readings. Reading. A lot of people have been asking lately, like, oh, it's been three weeks and I don't see much activity. What should I do next? Take a reading. Take a reading. That, that is the first thing we always say. And a lot of time the answer has, you know, their response has been, but yours took three weeks. Well, don't go by that. Okay, like for instance here, this was starting to slow down, but it's actually at 1.032 still. Nowhere near done. So I'm just going to take a note. I'm going to close this back up and put it back on the shelf. See you in another week or two. Okay, so this has gone for another two weeks. Hey, life gets in the way. And we're gonna take another reading on it. When last we looked at it, it was at 1.032, and we didn't think it was quite done yet. Today, after visual inspection, which actually looks quite nice, I don't see anything untoward, nothing growing where it shouldn't be. Um, let's see how it is. 1.016, that's interesting. Let me take a note. The reason why I say that's interesting is because this was done with Safeel SO4, not an actual mead yeast. So let me do some quick math here for you. And what I mean by that is Safe LSO4 has roughly a 10% alcohol tolerance. What that means is at about 10%, the yeast starts saying, nope, not gonna do anymore, not gonna swim in any more poop, okay? Because, you know, the alcohol, yeah, you get the joke. However, if you are a longtime viewer of this show, you know one thing that the yeasts may or may not know. What is that thing? Yeast can't read. Exactly, so they don't necessarily know they're not supposed to be doing that. Well, see, here's the thing. When I take that 1.089 and I subtract the 1.016 from it, and I take that result and I multiply it by 135, I get 9.8% alcohol, which means it's right on the cusp of, is it done or is it stalled? It's a fine line sometimes. In this case, I think I want to let this go another week before I make that determination. It was 1.032, 1.016. Let's see if another week it changes even more. Now, Derica had a concern about the fruit. I'm not as worried about it as she is. Um, she was worried mold, that kind of thing. That is something to be concerned with, but I do have a little trick that'll get rid of any concern. Essentially, once you put your lid back on, just give it a shake. And I don't mean violently, just enough to wet everything down. The it's a swirl. It's a swirl, basically. Do you see how the airlock is going a little bit crazy as I do that? That is gas being released. That means there's really not much oxygen in here, okay? I, I hate to say it's fully protected by CO2 because that's not actually the case. But CO2 does weigh more than air, so it will sit lower in the vessel than the air would or the oxygen would, and it should force the oxygen out as it's produced from fermentation. Hopefully fermentation is still happening. If not, it's degassing still, so it is still doing it. The reason why Brian stresses this and uses this as a precautionary measure against mold is because mold requires oxygen in order to grow. So creating that process which pushes the oxygen out and fills that void with CO2 is creating an anaerobic environment. 
In addition to that, Acetobacter, which is what causes vinegar, they really don't like 10% or higher alcohol. So once you get past 10%, it starts to really slow down. We're just under 10%. So we're still in the risk of vinegarization stage. So I wanna make sure that there's a lot of CO2 there because Acetobacters also need oxygen and alcohol in order to produce vinegar. So we don't want that to happen. What are we gonna do now? You know what's that? I'm gonna go probably another week. Let's see, does it go down at all? If not, then boom, next step. So it's been two weeks. Let's see what it's doing. We took a reading last time, it was at 1.016. I'm not convinced it's done or wasn't done at the time. So let's see if it's done now. Okay. I'm gonna say it's done. <laughs> well, it's probably done. It went to 0 0.0994. So that's a significant change from last time. Let me take a note. This is what you may call a late bloomer. So normally we say you should take two readings a week apart. If they don't change, that's when you rack. However, this has been sitting on these apples for six weeks. It's at 0.994. The likelihood of it going much lower is pretty slim and it's going to be still under airlock. So it's totally safe. Again, this went below 1.000. We're reasonably sure it's done. Totally safe to do this at this point, so we are going to rack this off the apples. Okay, when we say racking, what we mean is we're gonna get it from this fermenter into this pitcher, and then we can determine what size fermenter we're gonna put it in for what we call conditioning phase, which some people call secondary fermentation. In some cases, it actually is a secondary fermentation. In this case, it's really a conditioning phase, just gonna sit. So we just wanna take the lid off and do a visual inspection. Try not to talk directly into it, so I'm gonna hold my breath. We're looking for mold, we're looking for odd black, green, hairy spots, things like that, that say, nope, not drinking this, dump it out. I see nothing, this looks fantastic. And that is awesome, because I was actually very apprehensive about leaving this on apples for so long, particularly since they tended to float at the top, as you can see here. Yeah. And Brian's like, no, they're good. And I'm like, but, I but, swirled but, it but, every but. few days, so. So, yeah, we're all good. By swirl, I mean, I, I literally, like, shook the pitcher just a little bit to make it move around. Um, I'm not going to do that now, because we don't want to do that at this point. It'll just disturb the lease that's at the bottom. And I did leave the uh, cap on the auto siphon so that any of that lease on the bottom is not gonna get brought in. However, this is just the first rack, so it still has to clear and everything like that. I'm not gonna worry about it too, too much. The instructions for Hunting Brew Mead said, this should probably be drank young before it even gets to the stage. So we are breaking a little bit from the instructions, but I just don't feel that that's completely safe because we like to bottle our meads rather than just drink them right from the fermenter. So yeah, we are gonna break a little bit from the instructions. All right, now this is gonna seem a little bit redundant, but we racked it to a pitcher to see how much we have. And we actually have like 130 ounces. So we're gonna put it into one of these narrow mouth one gallon fermenters. It should all fit, no problem, leaving us with very little headspace. That's the idea. We're just racking. I did remove the cap now though, because there's no lease in the bottom here, so no worries. It's racked and just a little bit of headspace. We do talk about headspace quite a bit. You don't want to have a lot, it could oxidize. This is probably past the point of of vinegarization, which is 10%, but let's do a quick check. Using the calculator the teacher said would never be handy. It was literally right there. So to check our ABV, we have 1.089 is our original gravity. So we take the original gravity minus the final gravity, which is 0.994. That gives us 95 points of gravity spent. So 0 0.095 times 135 gives us 12.825%, which, okay, first, it can't be that accurate because our readings only go to two points. So there's just no way it's 12.825. I like to go with, it's 13%, close enough. It's 12.8, 13%, it, good enough. Um, so 13%. So 13% cool. means it is in the middle of when it's going to be difficult for vinegarization to occur versus when it's impossible for vinegar vinegarization to occur. Now, I'm pretty sure acetobacters, like yeast, can't read. So, you know, within a little bit of an, a tolerance range of that is totally fine. But this is 13%. I'm not worried about vinegar, but there is the other side, which is off flavors from oxidation. Sometimes they can be nice, like in sherries and things like that. Other times, not as much. They can make a, a nice mead or a nice wine go kind of flat and taste a little bit funny. So we're trying to avoid that. I'm gonna to try to 
talk really quickly about headspace. When we talk about headspace, we're not talking about this amount, we're talking about this amount. So it is the surface area contact between what right. might be oxygen and what might be your brew. So that's why we like to have it go up past this curve so that we have a smaller surface area. In other words, if you were using a long cylinder, it almost wouldn't matter how much air was in there because you have a very small amount touching that air. But with something that goes wider as it goes down, you want to keep this up in this kind of range, as little contact as possible. There's no perfect amount, okay? The only perfect amount is none, all right? But that's unreasonable and unrealistic in most cases. I mean, we're homebrewers. You do the best you can. That's the idea. But what are we going to do with this now? We're going to let it sit. Okay, so it's been two weeks. Guess what? It's time to take another reading on this, just to make sure it's really done. I mean, we, we're pretty sure it's done. As you can tell by all the stuff that we have out, we're pretty much sure it's ready to bottle, but just in case. Yeah, it's already been racked, and the reading dropped to 0.994 while it was racked. Oh, actually, no, we racked it at 0.994 because we were that sure it was pretty much done. So I'm, this is just, we're going through the motions at this point for consistency's sake and to make sure that we don't do something unsafe. You know, if, if this actually dropped some more, well, that's something to consider. I'd be kind of surprised, yeah, but it, it could happen. It could happen, 0.994. Okay, so we are totally safe to yeah. bottle, which normally we would say we're safe to rack. But we racked. We racked, so now we're gonna bottle. But we're gonna, we're gonna rack to a pitcher before we bottle. So I need to get the auto siphon ready. Yeah, racking. Same as we did before, auto siphon, one end into the pitcher, one end into the auto siphon. I am gonna leave the cap on. There is a tiny amount of lees on the bottom here. And by the way, if you say lees or lees, I'm okay with that. Technically it's lees, but um, I grew up calling it lees and I don't know why, but that's what I call it. So whatever you call it, I won't judge. At this point, we have racked it. We have 128 ounces, which is 3.785 liters. Exactly. Why do I know that? Because it's exactly one gallon. <laughs> So now we want to do a tasting. And what we're going to do is see, does this need anything? We already know it probably does. This is our final reconciliation tasting before we bottle. It's a little cloudy. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Well, see, here's the thing. This wasn't our recipe. This is one that we did from the book. So we're following their recipe. That, uh, that's why we're not going to add any clearing agents or anything like right. that. Right. We're also book adjacent because they don't even want you to get to this stage. You should be drinking it by now by their rules. I got a hunk of apple in mine somehow. Yes. I was telling you that when we were racking it, there were some floaties. Wow. <laughs> now, one thing to remember is this is about seven weeks old at this point. So this is much older than what the book calls for. Like she said, we're book adjacent. Um, it's also probably much drier than they expected it to be. The aroma is not unpleasant to me. It might be slightly weird it's, it's a little to astringent. Brian, but I am actually enjoying green. it. I'm getting the acidity. I mean, how do you get acidity through aroma? Yeah, but there's acidity I'm here. getting acidity through the aroma. Well, this is apples with ginger. But I'm also getting the lavender, lavender. in there. There's a bit of a floral yeah, note. Yeah, there is. There is a floral note. And it's not unpleasant. It's not reading soap. No, no. I wouldn't say this reads as soap at all. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm going in. Okay, first thing I want to say, not my thing. And I will second that with, not that bad. Not great. It's got a, a softness and a floralness, and I can see why Brian doesn't like it, but... It's too dry for me, too. I think sweetness will help... Mm -hmm. Bridge that gap, if you will. Oh, here, you can have mine then. I want your apple chunk. Um, <laughs> I'm going to decline giving a score. Oh, see? Yeah. All right, but you have to remember, Brian is the spicy yeah. uh, traditional guy. And I like this so little that I don't want to be unfair. This is floral and fruity mm -hmm. and not the sweet floral and fruity. Yeah. However... We are going to sweeten this. Once we sweeten it, I will give a score. Right now, I'm going to decline because I don't think it's fair. It, this is so far out of my taste range. It's floral and fruity with no sweetness whatsoever. It yeah, it's very dry. Tastes weird to me. Doesn't taste right. Doesn't taste good. Not that I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It just is so far out of my wheelhouse that I, I'd be completely. I can't be unbiased. So. I would like to back sweeten this with sugar. 
But one thing I want to do here, I would like to take one bottle of this and not back sweeten it oh. and leave that for a year. So we could do a side by side of an unsweetened and a sweetened version in one year. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. All right, so let's bottle one bottle right now into, um, yeah, this looks like a good bottle. Okay. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that right now. Okay. So we'll get the auto siphon out and uh, the bottling wand. If you are unfamiliar with our bottling process, we have a video dedicated just to bottling and I will put that link in the description below. Okay, so we have our one bottle that's unsweetened. that will go away for a year. Something I want to talk about too, part of the reason why I'm declining to do a score, and you noticed Erica didn't either, it's because the original recipe was meant to be sweet, meant to be sweet. So by letting this go dry, we kind of didn't do it justice. So it's not fair to the creators of the book to judge it at that point. Derricka liked it. That's a good thing. That's actually pretty cool. I didn't, but I don't want to be mean to the creators of the book because I don't think there's anything wrong with this recipe. I want to taste it as intended so that I can give my opinion on it at that point. So next, we're gonna add some sweetener. You said sugar. Why did you say sugar? sugar? I said sugar because we recently did a test that I believe will come out before this video comes out. <laughs> Probably. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Where we actually compared different types of back sweetening with different types of ingredients to see if there was a difference. And without giving away the outcome of that video that I did, I do think came out already by this point. See, we do several videos at once, so it's hard to know what comes out first. But there is a difference, and we don't want to have that difference show up in this, so we are going to actually sweeten this with sugar. But the one thing that we've said all along that was proven in that video is that if you want a neutral sweetener that just enhances sweetness and doesn't alter the flavor, sugar is the way to go. So right. that's why now I the, wanted to do that. The caveat to using white sugar is it is a fermentable sugar, so you do want to pasteurize afterwards, and we are going to pasteurize those bottles afterwards. But let me go grab the sugar. Okay, so we talked about our process now. We're like, oh, should we grab the scale? Oh, should we do this? Should we do that? And part of the reason why we're waffling on this is that our level of sweetness preference is going to be different from your level of sweetness preference. My taste buds can't read. And that's just how it is. Everybody's perception, everybody's reality is different from everybody else's. Right, so it's sweetening. science. You know, it's just like when you use salt and pepper when you're cooking. Season to taste. To taste. This is literally the same idea. So sweeten to taste. I'm going to probably end up using a quarter pound, roughly, but I'm going to start off with just some sugar. Yeah, Not much. that much. I'm going to mix that through. Now keep in mind, we're working with less than a gallon now because we did drink some of this. But we have our taster glasses. So after Brian has got that stirred all up, we can take a small sample of it and see if it's sweet enough to our personal preferences. Now we can also give you a final gravity reading at the end before we bottle. That way you have an idea of something to shoot for. So something is occurring right now that I want you to notice. Hopefully you can hear that. I think so. Do you hear the bubbles? Do you see the bubbles? This is what is called as nucleation sites and we've we've had this come up many, many times in our discussion in the comments where people want to back sweeten after carbonating and this is an illustration yeah. of why that does not work never mind the fact that you can't open a bottle once it's been carbonated without losing the carbonation that's okay. kind of an important okay. factor too so what happens is that a carbonated beverage or a beverage that has any sort of gas in it this is Keep a new mind, beverage we, we haven't degassed yet once the particles of sugar enter that, they create these little pockets called nucleation sites, and that allows the gas to escape the brew. It facilitates that, in fact, without you even Mentos doing anything. Mentos and Diet Coke, people. There you go. It's science. Now, I didn't put much in there. It was eh, a couple ounces. Still smells the same. See, we always do that. We always smell it, and we're like, it's not going to smell any different. It's, it's a sweetener thing. He made the face. I don't think it's sweet enough. Yeah, there's something here that I just really don't like. I don't think you like the lavender. It, it's entirely possible. I'm the gin, the um, not the ginger. The apple flavor is coming more forward now for me with it being sweeter. It's reading more apple to me. On the first and in, the initial, I was like, oh, this is better, and then, oh no. 
but it's like the apple right. lavender ginger combo creates this weird yeah. bitter drying yep. tannic thing on your tongue. Do you like it better now than before? I do like it better than now. Would you like before. it to be a little sweeter? I would like it to be sweeter. We normally are a team on these kind of things and try to work together. In this case, this really is probably going to be something that I will never drink. There's been others that I've said that, but I would drink them anyway, and we sweetened them until I liked it. This one I probably will not drink. I can tell you right now I probably won't. But I, that's why I'm kind of going off of what she likes. I know she won't complain about it being a little bit sweeter. You know, a little bit sweeter is not going to be a problem, but too much sweeter is going to be a problem. I'm currently having a serious cookie craving, so yeah, make it sweeter. Oh boy. Looks like I know what I'm doing after we film today. Every time you add some sugar, you want to make sure you mix it through because if you don't, you'll get more in one bottle than in another. So we want to make sure it's as consistent as possible. That's why Brian keeps glancing to the bottom because the sugar crystals that haven't dissolved, haven't gone into the fluid, will settle to the bottom and you'll be able to see them. It'll be a visual clue. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. That dissolved quickly. It was very, very dry. So it was a little thirsty, you know. <laughs> okay. It's still gonna smell Still the same. smells the same. <laughs> Bless his heart. I'm trying. You know, somebody asked me why I didn't just hand the pitcher over to her, and it, it was the passion fruit. Somebody mm. said, why don't you just hand it over to her and let her do it? It's because I won't give up till it's undrinkable. What do you think? I think that's pretty good. I think the sweetness level is finally coming to a nice point. Yeah. Um, I also know that given some time, this is probably going to improve. There is a green note coming through that I don't think is helping. I, and that could be the apple itself, because we know Yeah, the that's apple. By the way, the apple is why it's cloudy, the pectin in the apples. Yeah. If we were doing this recipe, I would probably have used pectic enzyme to clear that out. Yeah. I would have put that in immediately, because that's all that is, just a little pectinase. It doesn't hurt anything, probably no. doesn't change the flavor. No. Um, do you think that is sweet enough? Mm -hmm. I am not convinced that adding more sweetness to this is gonna make me like it anymore, so. I'm going off of what you said. All right, so it is time for a gravity reading. Okay, so we sweeten this to a 1.008, I think. Do you want to take a note on that for me? Yeah, I will. Just let me let me verify that number. Sure. Yeah, we actually, so we actually sweeten this to a 1.008, so I'm gonna take a note on that. Um, sweetened with sugar. So, like I said, I'm guessing that that went up 14 points. That's roughly a quarter of a pound. So pretty much in that range just to get it to a decent sweetness level. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. Oh. Once upon a time, there was this really handsome guy and this dorky girl named Brian and Derica. And they went to Vegas for a trip. I'm trying to figure out who the handsome guy is. <laughs> why, why you had another boyfriend named Brian. <laughs> and on their trip to Vegas, they went shopping because that's what you do. You, you, you gamble, you go to stores and you- I don't gamble anymore. Yeah, so we did shopping and we found this neat little place that was all really quirky and had all these glass shelves in the windows of all these bottles. And so we're like, oh, it looks like an apothecary. We gotta go in there. And it was called Von Foss. Oh, yeah. If you've ever been to Von Foss, then you know what we're talking about. It's like crack in bottles. And you go there and they give you free samples. And yeah. if you show any sign of excitement, they give you more. Yeah. <laughs> so guess what? We did not leave that store empty handed. Oh yeah, we did. They shipped it to us. They did, right, because <laughs> we're in Florida and we were in Vegas at the time. Yep. So yay, they made it super easy for us. Thanks, Bob Foss. Yeah, but they, they so found great ways to take our we money. We purchased over the time frame between that Vegas trip until when we started really hardcore home brewing a lot of money at Von Foss. And one of the things we purchased... Yeah, but that was more liqueurs and stuff. One of the things we purchased was a lavender liqueur. Not oh, for yeah. Brian, because Brian thought it was disgusting. I hated it. But for me, because I thought it was lovely. So that is part of the discordancy that okay. we are I, coming up with with this particular beverage. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. But. Now that you're saying it, that makes perfect sense. Yes, it does. We've already shown in several other videos that I'm not a fan of the flowery stuff. It just doesn't seem to sit well with me. This one, I here's the thing. This is an established recipe from the Skyrim cookbook, and I don't want to trash the recipe in any way. I don't want anybody to think that that's what I'm doing. These are flavors that are just not for me. I just don't like lavender, apparently. 
we any any time we've used it, I didn't like what we made. So, but besides the lavender liqueur esque flavor profile that's coming into this, that Brian absolutely does not have any respect for. I have respect for it. I just don't like it. There's <laughs> ginger. I like ginger. Ginger likes Brian likes ginger. Derica loves ginger. Yeah. Okay, I'm like a ginger holic. I can eat pickled ginger. I can eat fresh ginger. I can eat. She's got barbecue me eating pickled ginger. ginger I can eat ginger ale. It's you can like, eat ginger ale. That's a good one. Yes, I can. She chews it. I chews it. But no, ginger is my friend. <laughs> so, so we got the funky lavender plus the ginger plus apple, which I really like apple beverages. So oh, guess, yeah, this is a Derica beverage. Guess whose Will's house this yep. is, and guess whose Will's house this is not. Yeah, and that's the cool part about home brewing. Whenever somebody says to me, oh, I don't like mead, I say, well, what mead have you had? Because mead has a, such a wide gamut. It's the The rainbow. only constant in mead is there's honey in it. That's the only constant. You have carbonated, non-carbonated, high ABV, low ABV, sweet, dry, fruity, flowery, spicy, Herby, vegetal, I mean, oh my God, there's so many varieties. Unless you have a medical reason why you should not be partaking in alcohol, and if you have that situation, why are you watching this channel? Or- For entertainment if value. You, <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. We think we're funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, or if you have a medical allergy thing to honey, is that even a thing? Yeah, I don't, there are some people. Okay. It's rare, but it does then, happen. Then yeah. Hun mead is then not for you. It. Other than that, you could probably find a mead that you would like. Yeah. And you might have to make it yourself because yeah. there just isn't, as much as there's a wide range of mead that can be made, there isn't a wide range of mead commercially available. Yeah. And we found most of the commercial meads fall a little short of homebrew. And I think it's because of laws and regulations yeah. more than anything else. So I don't fault commercial meads. I don't fault commercial recipes. Everything has, is different and everybody has their own personal bias and taste. I also think there is an inherent flaw in mass producing, mass Anything. producing mead in Anything. particular because you need a vast quantity of quality honey. Yeah, gets very expensive. Yeah. And makes mead prohibitively expensive for the people that might actually want to appreciate it, but it doesn't fall into the same kind of category as wine. So the people who would spend money on wine would look at mead and say, why would I drink that? So it falls into this weird category. And I think that's why it's starting to take off, but not as much as maybe some of us might hope it would. All right, so we're babbling. So we're gonna go ahead and bottle this. If you are unfamiliar with our bottling process, we have a bottling video and I'll link that in the description below. So our scoring system for this one is going to be, I don't really like it. Derricka likes it. I don't think there's anything wrong with this recipe. However, if I was to add things to it, things that I would want to see, I'd like more apple. Two cut up apples just isn't really enough to me. I think it should be at least like six apples cut up and that would have added a lot more apple flavor and essence to it. Um, the lavender is fine. It's not my thing, but it's fine. The uh, two inches of ginger I think is a good amount, but I think it could even do with a little bit more. I think a little more apple and a little more ginger to balance out that very strong lavender flavor might have improved this a little bit. That's just my suggestion. Not everybody's gonna agree, but um, that would be what I would do if I was gonna remake this this recipe, so to speak. Honestly, if Brian was to remake this recipe, he would do all those things. I leave the lavender Take out. the lavender out entirely and then spice it. And add cinnamon, nutmeg, and allspice, and yeah, a few other things. That's what I would do. <laughs> but, you know, trying to keep in the spirit of it. So yeah, we are going to bottle this, and um, one of them is going to sit for a year, sweetened and pasteurized, and the other one is going to sit for a year unsweetened. And then the rest, Derek is probably going to drink them pretty soon. Yes, I'm also going to link our pasteurization video in the description below. I am going to choose our sous vide method because that's the method we're going to use today. Right. That is the method we recommend. It's the most up to date and it actually is the most effective and efficient we found and the safest too. But uh, as always, guys, thanks so much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye.